Who's made way for spring In every season From where I'm standing
Good morning, church. How's everybody doing? Woo. All right. I'm going to stand up while we worship God together. I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. A man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. And you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Whoa, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. And I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. You've seen them all, and you still call me friend. He's the God of the mountain, He's the God of the valley. There's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, 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 there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who cares. You turn mourning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who cares. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who cares. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. Lord, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. turn graves into gardens you turn bones into armies you turn seas into highways you're the only one who can 
You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. Amen. Yeah. Woo. Awesome. Uh, before you have a seat, go ahead and greet the people around you and tell them you're glad to see them. Glad to see you. Glad to see you. Nobody. Glad to see you. All right, you can go and have a seat, and uh, we're so glad that you have decided to join us this morning for worship. My name is Greg, and I have the privilege here at Ridgeline Community Church to work with the students, and if you're a guest with us, whether here in person or online, we just wanted to extend a special welcome to you and say thank you for joining us. Um, there's going to be information up on the screen in terms of how you can get connected uh, to fill out a digital connect card and Pastor Matt would love to get into contact with you and uh, give you a gift as well and just uh, our uh, small gesture of appreciation for you joining us this morning. Um, also, as we just continue to worship the Lord this morning, we do that through giving. And there's a variety of ways in which you can give this morning as well. There will be information up on the screen about that. Uh, also, uh, in the back of the auditorium here, we have an offering box. You can mail in your offering here to the church um, as well. Uh, I'm going to pray over the offering and over the service and just encourage you, uh, church, that as we pray over these things to amen and to agree uh, the Lord's will uh, as we move forward in worshiping him this morning. Let's pray. Father, we just come before you this morning and Lord, we're so grateful that we can come into this uh, this building as the church. Lord, we know that th this building itself isn't the church, but it's your people. And Lord, wherever your church is gathering uh, on this day and other days throughout the week, Father, we just pray that your name is lifted on high, that you're glorified, Lord, that you're made much of. Lord, that is why we're here. That is why we do what we do, is to make a big deal of you, Jesus. And Lord, as that's happening, we just think of some of those churches and think of the Rock Church and Pastor Mike. And Lord, as... Um, as they're gathering this morning, we pray that you would just bless that congregation, that you would anoint a fresh Pastor Mike to bring the word in such a way um, that it changes those lives at Rock Church. And Lord, as we just continue to pray, we just think of all the different uh, missionaries and, and people around the world that are serving you. And we pray for Lon, Father, and, and the bucket ministry, which I believe we're going to hear about here shortly. And just thank you for the work that, uh, that he's doing. And pray, Lord, that you would just bless him with resources and, and bless him just with opportunities through this ministry to be able to further your name wherever you take him, Father, uh, for, for your glory, for the gospel. And Lord, that we would just see a mighty work um, happen through that ministry. And Lord, we ask this morning um, that you'd be gracious to us, Father, as we just continue to worship you. And we give you these offerings, Father, and as we worship you through uh, the preaching of your word and singing these songs, Lord, all of this ultimately is for you and for your glory. And Lord, would you help us just to constantly keep our eyes fixed on you um, and on nothing else, Father. You are so good. We love you so much and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, Lon. You come on up. So as most of you know, about once a month, we take the opportunity to shine a spotlight on one of our supported missionaries. And this week we have, or this week, we do have the privilege to hear from uh, Lon Stubinger. And Lon, as you know, is a part of our church fellowship. At the missions banquet a few months ago, Lon and a friend of his, Chris Beth, who is the founder of the Bucket Ministry, um, came and shared with us about this incredible ministry. And so I'm just gonna turn it over to Lon and let Lon share with you about what God's doing through Bucket Ministry. Well, good morning. I'm a volunteer with the Bucket Ministry. Uh, I wonder if I could get a volunteer or two to come up and uh, try this water.
So I can say without qualification that the bucket ministry is one of the most efficient ways you can invest your missions money uh, in the world today. Uh, you can see the child drinking muddy water uh, that's full of parasites and things like that. Um, this, uh, the filter, though, is only a foot in the door for us. We, uh, we're not there to be a humanitarian organization. What we're there for is to say, hey, we're going to give you a way to, to stay healthy, but we also want to talk to you about Jesus Christ. And we don't just come once. We give, we give them the filter, we come back three times in the course of a year to make sure the filter is being used properly and more importantly, opportunity to uh, minister to people. Next slide. So uh, we ac actually have a uh, zebra stripe on, uh, on each filter and we, we can uh, tell with a GPS tracking where the filter is and uh, that it's still being in use. And you can see that uh, this is for one week, a couple of or last week, they've distributed 719 filters. Um, they had 140 people accepted Christ. Next slide, please. I didn't realize just how big it had gotten uh, um, since uh, I last looked. And you can see that there's 13 uh, places that we are uh, providing uh, safe drinking water and, and the word of Christ. Uh, and you can see that there's three follow-ups and uh, we have discipleship lessons. You can see in Kabira alone, the slum, uh, there's 32,000 people being discipled. Uh, and salvations at home uh, in Kabira alone, again, uh, 3,600. And 61 baptisms in 10 months. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, so in Kabira, uh, the giant slum that it is, the average income is like $27 a month. And so we have hired uh, people back in September, about half of these people, I taught them water sanitation and hygiene lessons so they could teach people how to wash their hands and things like that. And it's already doubled. Uh, and the plan is for, for this to continue to grow and to reach out to the 400,000 plus people that live in Kibera. Uh, next slide. So this is my buddy Josco, he's a pastor, and he joined uh, the Bucket Ministry both in Kenya and in Kabira. So he works both places for us, and just, he's just an amazing guy. I get uh, two or three Facebook updates from him a week. Next slide. Now, the Bucket Ministry really excites me. I mean, with, with, for $50, we can provide uh, a bucket filter or a bucket, um, and uh, a Bible, but uh, for $11 per child, we're providing a new program called Kids Club. And the kids are, are taught how to use the, uh, the filter. Uh, they're taught how to, uh, uh, they're taught how to uh, uh, worship Christ and learn about Christ. Uh, and more importantly, uh, or as importantly, there's a place for them to get out and move around. I mean. You just can't imagine the filth in Kibera. Next slide, please. Uh, here's the children learning how to use the bucket filter. You have to backwash this filter uh, pretty often to make keep it from plugging up, and that's what gives it the long lifespan that it has. Next slide. So um, uh, the uh, this is something that um, I was asked to. Uh, present for uh, Joe Fraser, your missions chairman. Let me read this to you. Um, a kind and thoughtful grandmother in our congregation brought her two elementary uh, aged grandsons to church the Sunday before Chris Best spoke. They heard my challenge that one dime a day uh, would purchase filter equipment needed for a family for 20 years. That's a great and obtainable investment to dedicate ourselves for this next year. I told both uh, told both services. The, ne the next week, Lil Caldwell directed me to this grandmother with a Ziploc bag full of dimes. She told me her sons were challenged by my request and informed her after church, Grandma, we can do that next week. And they did. Scouring drawers in their homes and grandmas, they came up with $52. Too often we look at the challenge as too daunting or troubling. 
while others like these boys can take it as a can-do project. So there you go, what are you waiting for? Next slide, please. Uh, so there's uh, potentially uh, 20, 200,000 children in Kibera that uh, we could potentially disciple. There's some flyers in the back. You can follow uh, the, the Facebook. You can follow the Bucket Ministry on Facebook. Um, and if you'd like to donate or pray, um, uh, you can pray for the uh, uh, or donate to the Bucket Filters or uh, to the Kibera Kids Club. <coughs> Next slide. <coughs> so, um, have you ever heard the, uh, have you ever watched Schindler's List, the true story about a German who saved uh, literally a thousand people from uh, uh, the Holocaust? But at the end of the, uh, the movie, it's just heartbreaking. Um, he breaks down and starts sobbing and he says, I could have sold this gold pin and I could have saved somebody's life, but I didn't. And that really haunts me. Uh, I'm just so always challenged to try to, to find more people willing to help support this program. Uh, the current need is $1,600 a month uh, for 150 children, and that's certainly going to grow. Um, and, and if you can connect me with other churches, with other people that, uh, that want to know about the bucket ministry, I think uh, God will really bless. Thank you. Amen. Hey, can we pray over lunch? Heavenly Father, we just thank you for Lon and thank you for his ministry. We thank you for the bucket ministry, what you're doing through them. And just the numbers on the screen that we saw a moment ago represent real people, real families, real life change that will last for all of eternity. And so, God, we praise you for that. We ask for more, more partners, more missionaries, more filters, and specifically for more kids to hear the life-changing message of Jesus and that they would come to faith in Christ and be discipled. Thank you for Lon, thank you for Chris and this incredible ministry. May you continue to provide for them and their needs and show us our part to play in this vital cause. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, will you give it up for Lon as we're back on our feet to worship the King? Let's stand together as we continue in worship.
There is no power in hell or any who can stand before the power and the presence of the great I am. Great I am. Great I am. Before him, the demons run and flee. At the mention of your name, King of Majesty, there is no power in hell or any who can stand before the power and the presence of the great I am. The great I am. The great I am. Here I stand, 
I am surrender I need you now hold my heart now and forever my soul cries out since I was broken but you love my whole heart through sin has no hold on me this grace holds me ground where the great did where all my shame remains left for dead in your way you crashed those age-old days you left no stone unturned you stepped out of that grave shouldered me all the way stand high in surrender I need you now hold my heart now and forever my soul cries out since I was broken but you loved my whole heart through it has no hold on me it's a grace on me chains are now. Death has no hold on me. This grace holds that crown. The grace holds me now. The grace holds me now. Father, 
Just as we've worshipped you through singing, now we worship you as we open your word together to study it, to read from it. And God, we just ask that you would be honored as we approach you in your word this morning. Speak to your people. Thank you for this gift of gathering. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. So if we didn't meet before this service and you're a guest, my name's Matt. Thank you for being here. Uh, we're blessed to worship with you. We are going through the book of Revelation. We're in Revelation chapter 11, so you can go ahead and turn there with us. And let me give you a fair warning. If you haven't noticed, my voice is going. Um, and so I attempted to be a little less rambunctious in the first service than I normally and that lasted for about 60 seconds. Um, and so just bear with me if uh, my voice does go out a little bit in this hour. Uh, Revelation chapter 11, we started two weeks ago, the week before Easter. Um, and we're going to walk a little bit slower through it today. Uh, sort of coming back to the passage and looking at some specific questions as it relates to the subject matter in Revelation chapter 11. So let's just look at the first couple of verses together and then we'll, we'll, we'll play a little catch up together and catch up to speed on where we are. Then I was given a measuring rod. So this is John speaking here. Uh, a, a rod like a staff and I was told, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. But do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out for it is given over to the nations and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. So if you're looking for time frames... Um, we are probably about the midpoint of what's known as the tribulation in the book of Revelation. There's a little bit of break from the main, uh, the main chronological events. And even though Revelation is not necessarily written chronologically, there are chronological events throughout, there are timestamps throughout the book uh, that reveal that. Revelation 10 to 12 is, uh, diverges a little bit from that. Still a main idea, it's not a rabbit trail and it has much to say. So the great tribulation as it's known is coming. It's also called the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, the final bowls of wrath are going to be poured out on the earth. So here's what we talked about last time we were in Revelation. First we reminded ourselves of some helpful keys in reading and studying the book. Then we looked into these first few verses that we just read. We read how John was told to measure the temple. And here's what we sort of discussed a little bit um, that we'll do in a little bit more detail today. Um, that there's a problem with that. And the problem with John being told to measure the temple is what? There's no temple. It was there just a few months ago. They've not started it since then. Many of you will have the opportunity to go to Jerusalem next spring with us and you will go and you will see the Temple Mount and you will notice the same thing I did. There is no temple in Jerusalem right now. So that presents us with two options. Number one option is this, um, that this means it's figurative. That the temple is figurative, it probably means the body of Christ um, in the tribulation. Or it's physical and it will be rebuilt, and a third temple must be rebuilt in Jerusalem at some point. The issue, of course, with this is this. Right now, there are other things there. Namely, what is, what is there on the Temple Mount today? There's a mosque and the Dome of the Rock. The Dome of the Rock is a shrine. The al Aska Mosque is, of course, a mosque. And if you've paid attention to world events, there's been fighting there outside al Aska Mosque even this week. This is the most tense place on earth, I believe. There is arguing and fighting over this site that we're reading about in Revelation chapter 11 today. And there has been for thousands of years. So what we read in Revelation 11 ties directly to the world we live in today. Shrine and mosque right now sitting on the Temple Mount. So just a little historical review. The first temple was built when? It was built in 957 BC by Solomon. Um, it was destroyed in 586 to 5. 
87 BC by the Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar. Um, the second temple was then built in 516 BC by Zerubbabel and modified by who? Herod. It was called Herod's temple because of the modifications he made to the temple. Um, it was destroyed in 70 AD by who? The Romans, under the leadership of a man named Titus, whose father was emperor of Rome at the time. <clears throat> Titus's goal, his stated goal, was that Jerusalem would be so destroyed that people wouldn't even remember the name of Jerusalem after this happened. So after Titus comes in, 70 AD, and the Romans uh, take the temple down, and the Romans are ruling in Jerusalem, here's what happens to the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem stops being a Jewish city and largely becomes a Christian city, so to speak. Right? There was a period of time where Jews were not even allowed here. So after the temple is destroyed, here's the problem. There's nobody left to actually rebuild the temple. They've all been kicked out as the Byzantines are ruling in Jerusalem. So the, no, the, temple has no, the Temple Mount has no temple on it for several hundred years. And because Jerusalem was a pagan and a Christian city, um, there's nobody there to even rebuild it. Now, several hundred years later, a man comes on the scene by the name of Muhammad. Now, you know Muhammad as the founder of Islam. And uh, Muhammad comes on the scene, declares himself a prophet of God, conquers the city of Mecca, and then a large part of the uh, Arabian Peninsula, not all of it, that would happen after, after him and the, and the leaders that would come after him. Um, Muhammad dies in 632 A.D., after Muhammad, and this is the next thing on our screen, you have the Rashidun Caliphate that rules in this part of the world, and they take over Jerusalem. So you have hundreds of years where the Byzantines are ruling, and there's no Jews there to rebuild the temple in Israel. And then immediately after them, you have Muslim invaders coming in, um, and so there's nobody left to rebuild the temple. About 50 years after these guys come on the scene, after the death of Muhammad, the Dome of the Rock is built. And al Aska Mosque, which started just as a small prayer chapel near the Dome of the Rock, which is now this magnificent structure. Um, the Rashidun Caliphate took over Jerusalem in 636 to 637 A.D. And it has been ruled by... Muslims, the Temple Mount has largely since that time for the last 1,500 years, except for a brief period of time uh, during the Crusades when the Knights Templar turned that into a palace and stables for their livestock. Okay, here is a picture of what you will see if you, if you happen to journey there with us next spring. You see the Dome of the Rock, and then down here on this end of the screen, you see the mosque. There's been no temple on the Temple Mount now for almost 2,000 years. Um, and so one of, the, one of the hard things that some people have when they read the book of Revelation is there's no temple there. They can't imagine a scenario in which the temple will be able to be built again, which I understand. Like this is, like I, 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 I have a hard time imagining how all of a sudden they're going to say, yeah, let's take down the Dome of the Rock, let's take down the mosque, and let's put up a Jewish temple again. Like, that's a bit of a stretch, right? I mean, we could agree with that. Like, some, some crazy things would have to happen. But can I remind you, we're reading the book of Revelation. Crazy things happen every verse. This is not a book full of just, you know, ho-hum normal life. Like, I mean, crazy stuff is happening. We're about to read about two guys who are able to turn water to blood and, and incinerate people with fire. So I'm not going to get hung up on the fact that there's not a temple there right now. Why does this matter? And why does it matter for a study of Revelation? Uh, because of the way this could be done. And I say could because it hasn't happened yet and the Bible doesn't reveal to us how this will happen. I simply say could. What separates the beliefs, let's ask this question. What separates the beliefs of Jews and Christians? That's it, that's it. I mean, it's one word. That's, again, every once in a while the Sunday school answer is appropriate. The answer is Jesus. 
And specifically, it's not just Jesus. It's that Jesus is the what? Messiah, right? People who are still following Judaism religiously do not believe Messiah has come. But those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ believe, even by saying Jesus Christ, Jesus Messiah, anointed one, okay? Now, if you are still waiting on Messiah, here's what you believe about Messiah. Um, Jews don't believe the Messiah has come, but when they believe the Messiah comes, they believe he will rebuild the what? Temple. We're in Revelation chapter 11, and we're reading about a man being called to go out and measure the temple. I don't think it's a stretch to say the temple has been rebuilt, okay? Um, and if the temple has been rebuilt, one thing that the book of Revelation does hint at <clears throat> is that there will be somebody who comes on the scene, who promises peace, rebuilds the temple, many will fall under his sway, that person we often refer to as the Antichrist. You see how all this fits together. Now, whether you interpret these things figuratively or literally, the main point remains the same, and we're going to get to that. Okay? Um, so after John is told to measure the temple, but not the court of the Gentiles, <coughs> excuse me, we are introduced to these two witnesses who speak for God. They carry God's authority in a prophetic ministry and they preach for three and a half years, empowered by the Holy Spirit. And God protects them during this time as their spiritual light in an increasingly dark world. The most important thing about the witnesses, and if you are taking notes, if you're studying this, the most important thing about the witnesses is very, very simple. They are empowered by the Holy Spirit. It's the most important part. It's not the most fantastic sounding part. The most fantastic sounding part is they kill people with fire. They're able to turn water to blood. That sounds incredible. Like, I want to see that movie, okay? I want to see that show. Like, but they're, they're, they're indwelled by the Holy Spirit. That's the most important part. Um, they have power and authority because they're empowered by the third person of the Trinity who is interested in working in your life as well. This is why we're talking about this. Right? Because the Holy Spirit that lives in the two witnesses in the book of Revelation, if you're a follower of Jesus, lives in you, inhabits you as well, dwells in you, wants to work in you. And so when we come together in a gathering like this on a Sunday morning, many of us sometimes act like we're coming to get topped off with the Holy Spirit. But if the Holy Spirit is a person, you can't get topped off with the person. You don't run out of the person. Right? We come together to encourage one another to live by the Spirit. So daily put to death the deeds of the flesh. Same Spirit in the witnesses dwells in us. We gather to celebrate, encourage one another, spur each other on to good deeds in Christ Jesus. <coughs> All right, verse 3. We're about to get into the nitty gritty. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone would harm them, fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them, this is how he's doomed to be killed. They have the power to shut the sky that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood, strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, some from the peoples and tribes and languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents. Because these two prophets had been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. That phrase that we talked about, those who dwell on the earth, is very important. Remember, it doesn't talk, just talk about people who live here. It talks about people who live for here. We don't just live on the earth, we live for the earth. We don't share any kingdom of heaven values. 
We're about ourselves, selfishness and power and authority, manipulation. That's those who dwell on the earth. But after the three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them. They stood up on their feet and great fear fell on those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. They went up at a cloud and their enemies watched them. And at that hour, there was a great earthquake and a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is soon to come. There are two questions that we are primarily going to address this morning. Maybe not to all of our satisfaction, but these are the two questions that we'll address. Number one, who are they? Number two, why are they sent? And there's a couple of options here to answer this first question about who they are. But we need to understand that the main idea being conveyed here is not identity. Um, the Holy Spirit through John is not primarily concerned that you and I would write in the margin of our notebooks or our, our Bibles that witnesses equal and then these people, okay? Um, that's a part of it and it speaks to what they do, but it's important in as much as it speaks to what they do, okay? Um, so that's not to say that their identity is not important. It's just not key, to what God is doing here. When we read Revelation chapter 11, I believe the language that John uses through the Holy Spirit, uh, the images that were given, is meant to draw our attention to two, primarily two Old Testament prophets. Uh, the two witnesses that we see in Revelation, at least, at least symbolically, and could be physically, but at least symbolically, are modeled after the ministry of Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah. And some people say, well, what about Enoch? Because he didn't die either. And that's fine. And that could be an option too. But the ministry spoken of here in Revelation chapter 11 is modeled after the ministry of Moses and Elijah. And so what the Bible is trying to get us at least to think of is how did these two men minister. What did they do? How did God use them in the Old Testament period of time? And what does that say to us about the future and what God is going to be doing then? You with me? So whether you believe this is literal or figurative, the point remains the same. We're called to think of, to remember the way these guys in the Old Testament ministered because it tells us something of what God is going to be doing in the future. And we'll get to that at the very end. And it's very, very important and encouraging, I think. So the two witnesses that we see, symbolically at least, modeled on Moses and Elijah in a couple of ways. There's a couple of things that we see here. Number one, they have the power to shut up the sky so that it will not rain. Right In the New Testament, uh, in the first century, when the New Testament was written, the story of Elijah was very, very well known throughout the Jewish community. Uh, so that James, went, the brother of Jesus, when he is teaching people about prayer, right, first century, same period of time that Revelation would be written, although Revelation was written late in the first century, when James is teaching people about prayer, he refers back to the man Elijah. He says, hey guys, you all know about Elijah. This is not a new story for you. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He prayed fervently that it might not rain for three years and six months, and it didn't rain. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. So the same period of time uh, that we read about all throughout the book, this three and a half years, we read about all the way back here in James chapter 5. We've read about it in Revelation. We're going to read about it somewhere else in a little bit. Um, so they have the, who are they? They are people who have the power to shut up the sky so that it will not rain. Who are they? There are people, number two, that have the power to turn the waters to blood and strike the earth with plagues. Um, that's the same power that we see from Exodus chapter 7, where Moses, acting prophetically on behalf of the God of Israel, turned the Nile to blood and saw the subsequent plagues rain down upon the kingdom of Egypt, who was holding the people of God captive. <clears throat> number three descriptor, they have the power to consume their enemies with fire. This is an echo of the power of God from 2 Kings chapter 1, where Elijah repeatedly calls down fire from heaven to consume the soldiers of an evil king who happened to worship a god called the Lord of the Flies. If you've ever wondered where that came from, his name is Beelzebub. He is the Lord of the Flies. 
And on multiple occasions in 2 Kings chapter 1, Elijah calls fire down to incinerate the soldiers of this evil king who served this evil God. So these two witnesses, regardless of whether they are Moses and Elijah, are coming in the same spirit, the power of Moses and Elijah. In other words, God is saying, hey, remember, think about these guys. Think about how I use them. Think about what their ministries primarily were about and even what their ministries themselves represented. So here's the message to us. When you think of these two witnesses, think of the deeds and the ministry of Moses and Elijah. And the Jews had, in the first century, long believed that both Moses and Elijah would somehow return before the end of time. (coughs) Mark chapter 9 After the transfiguration, the disciples are asking Jesus about this very thing. Why do other teachers, why do they say that Elijah is going to come back? Jesus, I don't understand. Why do we teach this? Why do we believe this? And I want you to see something that's very, very important, I believe. If you will turn in your Bible to the last page of the Old Testament. The last page of the Old Testament is in a book called... So some of you are like, you're like, why are these pages extra crispy in my Bible? No shame. We're not, we're not shaming you here. All right, the book of Malachi is the last prophet uh, to speak in the Old Testament. The last book in our canon of the Old Testament. Um, and I want you to see something that I, that I found very, very uh, just fascinating this week. The last Three verses in the Old Testament. This is the last thing God has to say before he's sort of silent for a while. And what does he say? Interestingly, verse 4 of chapter 4 in Malachi. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and the rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Remember Moses. Remember the law. Secondly, verse 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah. The prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Two things. Number one, um, remember the law of Moses. Mount Horeb that we read about here is also Mount Sinai. So God is telling the people, even though, and this is when Malachi was written, even though you're a tough-necked, crooked, perverse people, the way forward is simple. Remember what I've already told you. Remember what I've already done for you. Remember the Passover. Remember your deliverance. And remember the law I gave through my servant Moses. You've neglected me. You've neglected my law. It's interesting to me that the book of Malachi speaks so so precisely about issues related to generosity and giving. And it ends with, hey, remember all the stuff I told you guys in the Ten Commandments? Remember how all those commandments start? Don't have any other gods. Don't worship anything else. It's almost as if God is saying, when your heart gets right in worship, your heart will get right in giving as well. But you guys, your heart hasn't gotten right in worship, so we got to go back to that. So at the end of the Old Testament, he's telling Israel, he's telling Jerusalem, remember the law. Corruption and injustice were running rampant in Jerusalem at this time. You guys have not listened to or obeyed my law or my prophets. Remember the law given through Moses. That's the first thing. And the second thing he's saying here in these verses in Malachi at the end of the Old Testament is this. It's very simple. I will send Elijah before the Lord comes. I'm going to send Elijah before the Lord comes. So every year at the Passover celebration in Hebrew homes um, today, four cups of wine are presented and then drank. But then a fifth cup is also poured, but it's not drank. So you might know what that fifth cup is called. It's called Elijah's cup. Um, it, it is a ceremonial cup of wine poured during the family Seder dinner on Passover. It's left untouched in honor of Elijah, who, <coughs> excuse me, according to tradition, one day will arrive as an unknown guest and announce the coming of the Messiah, the Redeemer of Israel. It's really, it's it's a beautiful picture. Um, So what will happen in most Hebrew homes is a child usually will go to the door 
open the door and invite Elijah to come in. We've already prepared wine for you. There's a seat at the table for you. It's just that wine never gets drank. But they believe someday somebody's going to open the door and invite Elijah in and he's going to come in and announce that the Messiah is coming. Now part of that comes from the way they interpret this passage in Malachi. Um, And so at every Passover Seder, they sing the traditional song. I'm going to butcher these words. Um, Eliyahu Hanavi. And it has five parts. Eliyahu Hanavi, Elijah the prophet. Eliyahu Hatishbi, Elijah the Tishbite. Eliyahu Hagaladi, Elijah the Gileadite. Bimhera Yava Elenu, may he soon come to us. Im Mashiach ben David, with the Messiah, son of David. So who, who are they? We know they're modeled on Moses and Elijah. And we know that the passage in Malachi has something to tell us about something that's going to happen futuristically, at least from the time it was written. Okay, so that could be in our history or that could be in our future. Okay, so the, here, here's the second question. The more important question, not as who are they, but why are they sent? So based generally on the Old Testament prophets and specifically on the Malachi text, Jews have commonly believed that both Elijah and Moses would somehow return before the end. That's exactly why the disciples were asking Jesus after the transfiguration, when they saw Moses and they saw Elijah and they saw Jesus glowing up on a mountain, Right? Why they said, why do we teach that Elijah's coming back? Why do they teach that? But the response of Jesus is very telling to us, uh, not only of the ministry of Moses and Elijah in the past, but also of God's entire purposes for the prophets of the Old Testament and what he's going to do in the future, especially in Revelation chapter 11. It all ties together. So if you've got your Bibles open, flip over to Mark chapter 9. Look at Mark chapter 9. Uh, verse 11 through 13. It's on the screen as well. So the disciples asked him, why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? Why do the other teachers, why do they say Elijah must first come? And he said to them, this is Jesus responding, Elijah does come first to restore all things. How is it written of the son of man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? Verse 13 is the important part for us. But I tell you that Elijah has come. And they did to him whatever they pleased at his written of him. And I'm pretty sure the disciples did not quite get this, but Jesus clears up the mystery for us um, elsewhere in the Gospels. Matthew chapter 11. If you're taking notes, write down Matthew chapter 11, 11 to 14. And here's what Jesus says in Matthew 11. Pay very close attention. Jesus says, Truly I say to you, among those born of women there has arisen no one greater than who? John the Baptist, okay? Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. That's no different today than it was in Jesus' day. The violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. Now watch. (coughs) And if you're willing to accept it, he, who? John the Baptist, is... Elijah, who is to come. He was ears to hear, let him hear. Now, we say, Jesus, are you saying to me that Elijah from the Old Testament was reincarnated as John the Baptist in the New Testament? Is that what Jesus is saying? No, for two reasons. Number one, reincarnation is not real. And number two, Elijah hasn't died, so he couldn't be reincarnated. He's still just carnated, okay? Okay. Number two, does that mean that Elijah is John the Baptist in disguise? That John the Baptist was really not a real person? He was just Elijah pretending to be John the Baptist all the time? And at some point during his childhood, he did some kind of crazy Jesus juke on his parents, right? And Elijah jumped in and John the Baptist jumped. No, that's not what's happening at all. That's not what Jesus is saying. Um, What Jesus is saying is that... um, He came in the same manner as Elijah. That John's ministry was a ministry like Elijah's, 
that his calling was similar to Elijah's, that his gifting was similar to Elijah's. Um, But I also believe that there's a future fulfillment of this coming of Elijah because the prophet Malachi prophesied that he would come before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now, what are we reading about in Revelation chapter 11? That all things are moving towards this great and dreadful day of the Lord. Okay, so either God is going to send Elijah back for a special assignment toward the end or someone is going to come in the same manner as Elijah and John the Baptist in the New Testament toward the end That's what we're reading about in Revelation chapter 11. And the same is true of the second character that we read about in Revelation chapter 11. So again, I ask you the question, why are they sent? Why is it that we're sent, that they're sent? We've already read that they will prophesy and that the beast that will rise from the pit, who is also called the Antichrist, will make war on them and kill them. We've read about how their dead bodies are going to lie in the street of Jerusalem. For three and a half days they'll be displayed and it will be like Christmas because God's prophets are dead. What kind of evil is this? When the righteous ones of God are murdered and people cheer? I I mean, it is likely that they will create a new holiday called Dead Saints Day. Like People are going to go out and go shopping for gifts for people because the prophets of God have been killed. Now, I read Revelation, there's a lot of things in here that I think, I just don't, I don't, I, I don't know how that's going to happen. That seems so far-fetched for me. We've got, things have got to, you know, so, some crazy stuff's got to happen for this to happen. But I get to this part and I say, I, I can see that. I can see people cheering when the anointed ones of God are killed because the anointed ones of God are a plague on the people who dwell on this earth. It's remarkably Just about the only rejoicing in the entire book of Revelation. Um, But as is always the case, and this is one of the main points of Revelation chapter 11, God does not let evil have the last word. Evil is never allowed to have the last word. In history, evil is not allowed to have the last word. If you're a follower of Jesus, evil is not allowed to have the last word in your life as well. If God is the writer of your story, he ensures a good ending to your story. Weaving together the parts of life that are impossible for you and I to see, to even comprehend, until at long last we will be able to say, indeed, all things have worked together for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose. And maybe it's, In heaven, maybe it's when we see him face to face that all of a sudden those things will make sense to us and things that have been blurry will become clear. I don't know. But what I do know in Revelation chapter 11 echoes this, evil doesn't get the last word. So now again, why are they sent? What is God up to here in the book of Revelation, specifically Revelation chapter 11? Verse 11 says that after three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them and they stood up on their feet and great fear fell on those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying, come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies watched them. And at that hour, there was a great earthquake and a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. 7,000 people is a lot, but it's minuscule compared to the number of people that have been killed throughout the book of Revelation so, so far. And things are only gonna ramp up from here. But watch what happens. These two men were killed. These two witnesses were killed. They were resurrected and they ascended to heaven. Thousands die in Jerusalem as as parts of Jerusalem are crumbling to the ground. But then those who were left were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. Here it is. Giving glory to the God of heaven is a mark of real, genuine worship. We're talking life change here. We're talking a harvesting of souls. So what we're seeing here in Revelation 11 is the fulfillment of the promises of God. Now I want you to see this with me. This, I believe, is one of the most important parts. It was not the power that came from these witnesses that saw men and women turn to Christ. For years they're preaching and fire's coming out of their faces. They're turning water to blood, calling down plagues. 
And where have we seen the revival so far? It didn't happen because of that. Makes us think of some of the Old Testament prophets who preached and preached and preached and nothing happened. Nobody repented. We see these New Testament prophets in the book of Revelation preaching, preaching, preaching signs and wonders, which is what we crave. And nothing has happened. And what does God use? Their murder. God takes their martyrdom. God takes their resurrection. God takes their rescue. A ministry of fire breathing never reached the masses, but their lives being laid down did. And isn't that always the way it is? Isn't that the model that we've seen throughout this wonderful book so far? Do you remember this? And one of the elders said to me, weep no more, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has conquered. And all God's people are like, yes, the lion, that's my king, that's my Jesus. I get fired up at that. So that he can open the scroll and it's seven seals. And everybody's fired up. Wow. Jesus, Jesus. That's what he heard, but what he saw. Between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. He heard a lion, but he saw a lamb. A lamb slain for the sins of the world. And that's the way. It's always the way. It's the way it's worked in your life and in my life. It's the way God inspires us yet even today. Have we not in our own lives been more moved by the humble sacrifice of men and women who spent themselves for the glory of the king? Then we have the great speakers the great leaders of the world. Is it not a man in AD 34 who laid his life down, being pummeled to death with stones? Is it a guy like Richard Wormbrand, who was imprisoned in Romania from 1948 to 1965? That is a long time to be imprisoned in solitary confinement. And upon his release started a ministry that we know today as the voice of the martyrs. When he was asked how could he love those who were torturing them, him, he said by looking at them not as they are but as they will be. Is it the great and the powerful that moves us? Or is it the Cassie Bernals? The Rachel Scotts? The Stevens? that lead us to the feet of Jesus. You know this to be true. We all do. God uses the absurd weakness of humanity. If, if not, then we have no hope to be used of God. And sacrifice is the greatest imitation one can offer of the lamb who was slain. And these witnesses will sacrifice for Jesus, which, by the way, is the point. Moses and Elijah, the law and the prophets. Here's where it all comes together. What is this all for? Remember, remember Moses, they were told. Remember the law, and Paul tells us why, Galatians 3, 24. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to what? To Christ. The law the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments, was given as a tutor to simply stand up and point and say, Jesus! To point to Christ. To lead us to Christ that we may be justified by faith. The law was always pointing to Christ. Preparing the people for who? Jesus! Messiah! Remember Elijah. Remember the great prophet. Look for him. And then one day, someone came in the New Testament in the spirit of Elijah. Do you remember what he did? Matthew chapter 3 tells us, In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. What did he preach? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. It's at hand. 
For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, doing what? Saying, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. What did John in the, in the ministry of Elijah, the prophets come on the scene doing? He pointed to Christ. Get your life ready for Jesus. What was the law given for? To prepare people for Jesus. What were the prophets for? To get people ready for Jesus. To get you ready for Jesus, pointing to Christ, preparing for Christ. Why? Because at this time, in the New Testament, when John was doing his ministry, Jesus was coming. In the book of Revelation, chapter 11, here's what we're sure of. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. What are the witnesses doing? Whether you believe they're Moses and Elijah themselves, whether you believe they stand for the church, whether you believe they're two other witnesses who stand in the ministry of a Moses and Elijah, they're doing the same thing. They're calling out to the world. Prepare the way. Jesus is coming. Repent. Turn from your sin. God loves you and wants to spend his forever with you. Repent. Jesus is coming. So why the witnesses? So that even in the midst of the perversity and the horror at the midpoint of the tribulation to point people to the God who loves them. Jesus did not win salvation for humanity through his might, not my might, nor by power. He won it by actually dying for the people who killed him. What an example for us. I honestly believe the most counter-cultural thing the people of God can do in this day, in this generation, is live with humility. Just live with humility. And that's what the Lord used, that's what the Lord used with these guys. They laid down their lives and the Lord delivered them. And many people came to faith in Christ. So just pointing. It's my job. It's your job. It's your job. Be a prophet. What does that mean? Does it mean to spit fire? No, it means to point. Jesus. Do do the job of the law. Point people to Jesus. In humility and grace. Tell the hard things. Repent. The kingdom is at hand. Why? God loves you and he wants you. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, in the name of your son, Jesus, thank you for your grace today. Thank you for (coughs) the opportunity that we have to respond to what you have done. It is not about us. Oh, Jesus, it's not about us. It is about you. We want to be men and women who are faithful to simply do the simple yet profound task of pointing. It's been the call of God on your people from Moses to the prophets to John the Baptist to in the future with these witnesses to point, to prepare the way for Jesus. God, may my life demonstrate that. To point others to you. My home, my work, my community, and my church. We love you. We bless you. It is in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Hey, dear ones, will you stand with me? as we continue to seek him in worship.
The head that once was crowned with thorn is crowned with glory now. The Savior knelt to wash our feet. Now at His feet we bow. Oh, praise will rise to Christ. Our 
Before you go, just a couple of things that I want to mark your card on. Uh, Number one, if you are a guest with us today, whether you registered or not, there's going to be a Next Steps lunch directly after this hour in room 106 in the back right-hand corner. Plenty of food for you. Uh, Just a time for us to sit together to talk about what next steps with the church looks like, how to get connected to small groups, to ministries, uh, what things will be available to you and your family. Also be a great opportunity for you to meet uh, some other people. And so I just want to invite you to that. Also, May 22nd is Be the Church Sunday. Uh, This is an all-hands-on-deck project where we need everybody. There is a place for everybody in this. Um, If you're not familiar, this is a day where we'll come together at the nine o'clock hour. We'll worship together for a few moments and then we divide up into teams that we've already registered for um, and we will go out into the community to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. This is a powerful, a powerful sign to our community um, that we actually do what we believe God tells us to do. We want this to be a testimony to the community around us that Jesus has actually done something in us. And so you can sign up for that on the table um, out in the hall. You can also respond to the sign up genius that should have been emailed to you earlier this week if we have your contact information. And then the last thing I'll mark your card on is next Sunday evening, we're hosting a time uh, to explore our next trip to the Holy Land which will be next May, it looks like. We'd love for you to come, eat some hummus, see some pictures, ask some questions, and hear us talk to you about um, what God has done in us since our last trip to the Holy Land um, and answer any questions you might have about that. You can sign up for that out in the hall as well. I love you. I'm praying a great week for you. Um, If you are a guest, we do invite you to stick around. And if you can't stay for lunch, I would love to meet you. Have a great week. We'll see you next time.
troubles to come. The lily's not thinking about the seasons, the drought or the flood. The tree that's planted by the water isn't phased by the fire. So why should I be? Cause you take good care of me. You take The sun's not worried about the winter, cause soon it will pass. The light's not thinking about the darkness or the shadow it cast. A heart that's planted in forgiveness doesn't dwell in the past. So why should I be? Cause you take good.